Okay, so in the last video, we defined a finite state machine and walked through how to set up a state encoding and implement logic that actually runs this state machine. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to do the same thing, but in VHDL. Okay, so I've just created a basic entity here for candy lock, <clears throat> and it's got the black button input, the yellow button input, and red and green LED outputs. And and of course we have a clock input that's gonna drive the progression of these states. Every time we have a rising edge of the clock, um, the register is gonna get the next value and that's what's gonna drive the state transitions. Okay, so to implement this, um, we can go ahead and just fill in a process that's gonna form the register here. So it's a process clock begin. And we'll need our end process down at the bottom. Okay, and of course, we only want to do things on the rising edge of the clock. We want to create flip flops. So if rising edge clock, then we do stuff. And we can end our if here. Okay, so now we need some way to define the states. And the first thing you might come up with, like the first thing that comes to mind, uh, depending on how much C coding you've been doing or other things um, you've been thinking about, would be to just define a bunch of constants for the different states. So I could define, uh, VHDL does let you define constants. So I could say constant, uh, give it a name like idle, and that would be a standard logic vector um, with two bits. So one down to zero, and we could just define that to have the value zero, zero, right? And I could do that for each of my four states. So I have idle, yellow pressed, yellow, uh, greater than one, and open. And so I could come up with those four constants, and then I could just use those constants throughout my code here, right? And that would be way better than just putting in zero, zero without any means, right? So just like in any other programming language, using named constants is better than just using literals everywhere in your code. That makes it a lot easier to read and a lot easier to change and update things. But it turns out we can actually do even better than using named constants. And what we're gonna use is, um, our, we're gonna create our own type. Uh, this is very much like creating an enum in C and C++. So we can say type, Say we'll give the name state is, and then we can define a set of states. So for example, we can say idle yellow um, so let's like say yellow two. Uh, so like two or more. Um, actually maybe yellow yellow greater than one and open as our four states. Okay, open is a keyword, so Let's call it lock open. Okay, so we've defined our state, and now we can define a signal that has that type, right? So normally a signal's gotta have, you know, type standard logic or type unsigned or, or whatever, um, but we can define a, a signal with this new type that we've just defined. So signal S is of type state. Okay, so why would we do this instead of just a bunch of named constants? Um, the advantage here is that we haven't specified any particular bit mapping associated with these. We've just said that there is some set of states. Um, and this gives the synthesis tool complete freedom to pick a state encoding that works best. Right? And the synthesis tool can try way more things than you would have patience for. Right? It can try a one-hot encoding, it could try using a binary encoding with all the different possible, in, you know, swapping them around the assignment, what, what bits you're assigning to which states around and picking whatever happens to work out best, um, like minimizing the overall logic. And so if you don't specify any particular encoding, then you're giving the tool freedom to do the best thing it can find. And because the tool can try a whole bunch more stuff than you can, um, it's likely to come up with something better than what you're gonna come up with just 
making something up like we've done in the past. Okay, so we're gonna use this state um, enumeration and create a signal with that. Then how do we actually implement the state machine? And this is sort of the really beautiful part about doing a state machine in VHDL. So we can just come up with a case statement, write a case statement that's going to enumerate all of the possible states and what to do in each of those states. So we can say when, sorry, let's start off with the case. So case s, s is our state variable again, is, and then we can say when the state is idle. And then now we can specify the behavior to perform when we're in the idle state. So we can just say if uh, y, then, so again, in VHDL 2008, we can just specify y um, as, as if it were a, a Boolean true false value, even though it's actually a uh, standard logic. And we don't have to specify a comparison like we would prior to VHDL 2008. So if y, then the state is going from idle to yellow. So the state is going to get yellow. And otherwise, um, so if either the black button is pushed or nothing is pushed, then we're just gonna stay in the idle state. So else, yes. Don't forget our semicolons here. And if. Okay, now we've just specified the idle state, so let's go ahead and specify the yellow state. So when yellow. So here, if the yellow button is pushed, we move to the yellow greater than one state. Otherwise, if black is pushed, we move to the open state or just stay put. So if yellow, so if y then, just copy this, yellow greater than one, else if b for black, then s gets lock open, and else we're gonna stay in the same state. Yeah, so stay yellow. And okay, third state. So the yellow greater than one state. So when yellow greater than one, If y, uh, we're actually gonna stay in the same state, so let's lump that in with the else case. If b, then we will move to idle, so let's copy and paste that, so s gets idle, and otherwise, we're gonna stay in that yellow greater than one state. And that if, and when lock open. So unconditionally, we're going to move, uh, S is going to move back to idle. And then finally, we need to specify the other's case. So remember that just because we've specified these enumerated values, if anything in simulation rate is unknown when it first comes up or X because of contention or whatever, um, then we need to specify a value. And again, this is not just in simulation. We, When the thing turns on, we wanna make sure that no matter what state it ends up in, uh, that it always has somewhere to go where it would be a known starting place. Um, in this case, the way we've set it up, there's four states and only four possible encoding four possible values for the state variables. So you couldn't get stuck with the real hardware. Um, but imagine that we had five states and so then we needed three bits. Then there would be three states that aren't, or three possible values for those bits that don't map to a specific state. 
and we would have to specify what, what would happen if we ended up with any of those bit combinations when we turn the circuit on. So make sure you always specify uh, the when others case um, when you're writing out the state machine. So here I'll say when others um, and so the S will just go into the idle state. It's the natural locked place for that to be. And this concludes our case. Okay, so that was a little bit verbose, um, but at least it was very, very straightforward. And we can write out every single case, just or every single state just gets one chunk of the case statement, and all the transitions just get put in an if else. Um, this is a very straightforward mechanical translation of our finite state machine as written as a state transition diagram, turning it into the HDL code. And th again, this is kind of the power of the FSMs that once you've worked this out in terms of the state transition diagram, you don't have to do a lot of thinking to turn it into something that works. And I should add, you can do this with code, right? You can write a case statement in C or C++ or whatever other programming language. You can define some variables, you know, just regular old variables in programming in the programming language to be your state variables. You can use just this if else construct. So this, this basic construct can be very powerful in a software context as well to implement sort of complex behavior that has to process inputs and produce outputs and so forth. Okay, so the, the final thing that's missing, we've got our inputs, we've got our state transitions, we need to actually produce the outputs. And the key here again is the outputs are just combinational functions of the state. So I want to be outside the process block, this is combinational logic again and not Sequential logic, I don't need extra registers and so forth. Um, and so I can just write red get the value one when state is idle, else gets the value zero. And again, here I haven't written out like red is the nor of the state bits or something like that. I'm not worrying about what the particular state bits are. I'm just trusting that the synthesis tool will figure that out and do the right thing. So again, green will get the value one when S is in the block open state and otherwise get the value zero. So here it is, we have the state machine implemented in VHDL just by sort of very simple, straightforward translation of the state transition diagram. One of the first things you're gonna to wanna to do when you start tackling a more complex problem is how do I specify some sequence of actions to take? Like first this needs to happen and then this other thing needs to happen. And sort of at first it's not at all obvious how you do that in hardware. And the answer is almost always you build the state machine and you specify the sequence of actions as um, outputs of this state machine. And then you, you just set it up and you execute that state machine and it, it runs through all of the states and it can make decisions um, and now you have a tool for doing sort of sequential processing in much the same way as you might write software code.